Hello, my name is Lynn Gordon and I'm the admissions lead for radiotherapy and oncology programme at undergraduate in the University of Hertfordshire. Um, just a, a warm welcome to our offer holders. I hope you're not having too many problems with the current restrictions on travel, etc. due to the coronavirus. Um, but we do need to give you some resources related to our programme so that you're fully informed of um, our university, its facilities and what we can offer you on the programme so that you're better informed when you're making your final decisions. I thought it might be nice to start this presentation by just introducing you to the lecturing team here at the University of Hertfordshire. We have seven, uh, 11 lecturers and some of us are full-time like myself and some people work part-time um, and indeed one of our um, senior lecturers, Lou, who's in, in the spotted top on the top left hand picture. She still maintains a clinical role at Mount Vernon Hospital and she works with us two days a week. Um, so we're really lucky to have Lou. She's an advanced practitioner um, and so she's got a really great balance of her clinical expertise and also um, her, her lecturing expertise as well. Um, but we are all qualified radiographers. We've um, all maintained our Health Professions Council registration so that we could go out to placement and either assist with the radiographers there or to supervise our students while they're undergoing their placement learning. Um, we are a teaching and learning focused university here at the University of Hertfordshire. That doesn't mean to say that we don't do research but um, our prime aim is to make sure that our students have a great education and that it is of a high quality and this means that the university does put really great resources in place to make sure that the staff develop alongside the student development. I also thought it might be good for you to get a feel for who our students are. Now we do recruit um, a lot of students locally and by locally I mean a 30 to 40 mile radius of Hatfield which is where the University of Hertfordshire is based. We are only about 20 minutes north of London if you travel by train. So that's from Hatfield Station down into King's Cross. And so we do have a, a large proportion of students who come out of London to carry out their studies. We do have students who come from all over the world. Um, we have students at the moment who are from Hong Kong and other parts of Asia and India. Um, but we also have such a cosmopolitan cohort as well in each of the three years. Um, and so um, you're going to meet up with students from all sorts of different backgrounds and cultures and religions. And we really value this um, because it means that you're being exposed to all the sorts of people that you will be meeting in the patients that you meet when you're out on practice and once you graduate. So this is something we absolutely value is the diversity of our student cohort. Now if I just go through some of the pictures here so you can meet some of the students. On the left hand side um, you can see that most of the students there are wearing pink and if you look very carefully you'll spot me as well, that third from the left. Um, and this was at the end of a lecture on central nervous system tumours and this group of students had decided to do some fundraising for breast cancer charities so they um, took part in the Wear It Pink campaign um, and included the lecturers as well. Um, the top middle picture and the right hand picture I just thought it might be Good for you to see some of the activities that our students do while they're in the classroom. Um, it might look like there are not very many students in these classrooms and that's because these are small group tutorials where we were focusing on very specific topics and the students were working together um, in discussion in order to explore those topics further. And although Eve in the centre there looks like she's just on her mobile phone not paying any attention, well that's actually because she's doing some work and was looking up some information for us. And then it's always really good to think about how you're going to look when you graduate from a programme. So uh, this picture at the bottom is the graduation photo of our 2019 graduates um, looking really smart in their caps and gowns. And this picture was taken in St Albans Cathedral, which is where we hold most of our graduation ceremonies. On this slide, you can see how we structure our degree. Um, we are 
bound by the HCPC standards of education and training and the Society of Radiographers um, requirements for the competencies that we expect radiographers to have by the end of the degree. So the difference between our degree and a degree at a different university is not going to be the subject matter that you study, but it's going to be the way that we package it and how we deliver it. So in, we have two main themes that we deliver across all three years. The first one being the radiotherapy practice team theme and the second being the oncology management theme. Um, these are the most important topics. We need to make sure our radiographers are safe, competent practitioners. And so that develops throughout the three years in the radiotherapy practice modules. But we also need to know that you have a very clear and deep understanding of how different cancers are managed. And what that means is the different treatments available, the different supportive ther therapies available, and how an individual person's circumstances might impact on the way they manage their own health and illness and what makes some people able to tolerate um, some treatments whereas other people can't and so the the level of, of learning that we expect kind of ramps up across the three years so in the third year you'll be learning more complex radiotherapy technique in the practice module and in the oncology module you'll be learning about um, cancers that have more complex management um, regimes and so by doing it this way we can ensure that we give you the basics early on in the degree and then work gradually up to the end um, and then by doing that also it means that you can learn to apply your knowledge and be able to critically think and evaluate different practices by the time you're hitting year three. Alongside those modules, we have our science um, and planning modules in the first and second year. We have a large anatomy and imaging module because we want to make sure that you have a really, really deep knowledge and understanding of how the human body is put together, um, how it, it reacts normally and then what happens when cancers develop. But we also teach you about a few other di um, diseases so that you understand some of the things that might impact on how we deliver radiotherapy. We have two modules, one in the second year and one in the third year, that relate spe specifically to research and evidence in radiotherapy. Um, all the practice that you'll see out in a clinical department is based on evidence as to what works best in a particular situation and some of this is expert practice and experience and other of it is going to be the research evidence base that has been done and so we will teach you how to effectively critique the evidence base so that you can think about what your own practice is and how you might improve it in the future. And then in the third year, we ask you to do a research exercise. So you're putting into place your knowledge and understanding of the research skills and research methods that you learn in the second year. A common question I'm always asked is, well, how am I going to learn? Am I gonna just be taught or will there be other things that happen as part of the programme? Now, what we pride ourselves on at the University of Hertfordshire is making our learning student focused. So I'm not here to stand in front of a lecture hall and talk at you. My job is to facilitate your education such that you become critical and inquiring practitioners. So I expect my students to be interactive in sessions, to question if they don't understand something. Um, and I welcome lots of contact outside the lectures so that we can explore issues that um, students don't think that they've quite got a handle on. Um, the main um, teaching and learning takes place in a number of different settings and in a number of different ways. So the top left hand picture you can see there is a, a picture from a little while ago now. And this is one of our um, students, Peter, who is operating our virtual linear accelerator in the vert lab um, and this is something that is used throughout all three years for student learning um, we have sessions which are led by um, one of the lecturers but we also open up the lab for students to do their own directed or self-directed learning as well <clears throat> when it's not being used for formal teaching purposes 
Uh, the top right hand picture is just a picture of a typical tiered lecture theatre. Now, as I said, our lectures are not just what we call didactic, me standing in front of the classroom just talking to the students. Um, we build in um, some group work or some shared activities or um, teamwork activities within those lectures because what we want to do is give you some information and then make sure you've assimilated that information. So we might do some online quizzes during those lectures, we might get you working on worksheets during those lectures etc so that across a two hour period it's not just going to be one person standing at the front of the classroom talking to you, you'll be getting involved as well. The middle picture there is a picture of our CT scanner. Now this is a resource that's shared with our diagnostic colleagues, um, but we use this regularly to help our students learn patient positioning, how to use the scanner, how to set up for um, good images. Um, that's not a really skinny person on the bed, that's actually a, a full length body phantom. So it's a, a, a plastic skeleton that's set inside um, some simulated body tissues so that we can try and make these um, situations as realistic as possible. And on the right hand side, you can see Tracy, um, one of our senior lecturers who's guiding the students in the operation of the CT scanner. So it is a fully functional CT scanner. It's not um, a simulator like the, the VERT um, lab is, um, which means that we also have to make sure our students are fully appraised of all the radiation safety issues that um, come with working with that equipment. Um, within the university setting. On the bottom left and bottom right, um, it's a repeat of that um, picture we saw you be saw before, but these are small group settings, so practicals and workshops that take place in our skills labs. We get students working together, we give them some problem-based um, work to solve, um, and so we really kind of use the full range of different teaching and learning options with our students to ensure that we're embedding what we call deep learning. It's not something that you're just going to learn for a particular assignment and then forget. We need you to embed it deep so that you can recall it in three years when you're practicing as a qualified radiographer. Now, on top of all this classroom based and skills lab based learning, there's also going to be lots of work for you to do yourselves. So within a 15 credit module, which is worth 150 hours worth of study, around about 100 hours of that is what you're going to be doing on your own with lots of reading and individual researching of topics. So we've got several really fantastic resources to help you out with that. I just want to say a little bit more about the independent learning, though. Um, we believe that learning should be student centred, and this means that some students learn in different ways compared to their colleagues. So we might have students who learn best by always being in the classroom, listening to what the lecturers are saying, um, and they can learn really well with that. And we also have other students who can't learn effectively unless they follow up that learning with writing their own notes or by accessing other resources. And so what we have to do is make sure we've got lots of resources for the students to access. And so we have a really, really well-equipped library at the university, um, but it's also about thinking about what our students need. So we will facilitate the basics and then give you some instruction and study skills sessions so that you know where to go to find other resources that are going to help your learning. When we look at the average timetable, a student is likely to have between 18 and 20 hours per week in the classroom. Um, and the rest of the time um, you need to be spending on doing your own study. Um, a full time student can expect to be studying for around 40 hours a week. So if you're only doing 18 to 20 hours in the classroom, that does mean you've got another 20, 22 hours to, to do in your own time um, in your own way. I spoke about our fantastic learning resources and I'm sure there are other videos on the university website that will take you on a, a, a visual and virtual tour of those facilities. But I just want to um, let you know of what we've got that will help you within our programme. So yes, we have very well equipped li large libraries, one on each of our campuses, but all our health students are based on the College Lane campus. And so the picture in the middle of the screen is 
one looking down the central atrium of the College Lane Library. Um, what you can see at the bottom of that picture is the cafe space with some um, computers there for students to use and also down there are some sleep and relaxation pods. This space was actually designed by student for students for students. Um, the cafe is open from around about seven in the morning till about six in the evening, but they also have vending machines so that if you do want to spend 24 hours in the library when you've got an assignment coming up, um, then it's possible to do that and feed yourselves without leaving the space that you've set up to study in. Um, the library is open 24 hours all year round, apart from when the university closes at Christmas holiday periods and Easter holiday periods. So moving up from the cafe area, you can see some large tables. These are designed so that students can work together if they wish. But we know that sometimes students want to, to work alone. And so on the wings of the library, and you can just about see on the right hand side a door there with three um, glass portholes. Those are our um, silent study rooms. They're individual rooms. So they're kind of like a little cupboard, but they've all got in internet access. And it means that you can shut yourself away in one of those if you don't want to be disturbed. So you have to book use of those so that um, all students get fair use of them. Right at the edges of the library, which are not shown on this picture, we also have group study rooms. So that if you have a, a group assignment to work on or you work better with your peers, you can book a group study room and within those rooms are a large table, internet access, um, um, AV aid. So you've got a PowerPoint connection, sorry, a, a projector connection, um, whiteboards, flip charts, etc. So that you can study effectively out of the way of the rest of the library. And we also appreciate that some of our students do like some silent space for studying. So there is an area on the top floor that is set aside for silent study as well. This is the physical library. That's only a very small part of our provision. We have extensive online and virtual learning resources. And so what you can see at the top is a, an example of one of our Canvas virtual learning resource pages. And so for each module that you study, you'll have one of these pages and you can see the red links that will take you up to other resources. And then on the, on, in the black links that will take you to different parts of the virtual learning environment, such as the library resources where you can find electronic books and journal articles, etc. For our four, um, level four or first year students, we also have um, a, a, a system called Grade Up, which is where the library will put on sessions to help you improve your grades if you feel that you've not been as successful as you want to be at your first attempt. OK, so the idea of this is that if if students want to improve their grades, they can sign up to these courses and they'll give you extra hints and tips in order to help you be more successful with your learning. And there's a vast amount of different um, online tutorials and webinars, etc., that are hosted within our virtual learning environment. Uh, we get students to sign up to what's called Eduroam Wi-Fi, um, and this means that they get excellent access to Wi-Fi throughout the university campus. But it also means you can access free Wi-Fi at any other educational institution that has Eduroam um, licensing. So, for example, if you're out on placement and you're at placement has a medical school, that will have Eduroam Wi-Fi and so you can connect there as well. One of the things we're most proud of at the university is the way that we support our students. And this is something that is consistently rated very highly by our third year students when they're um, completing the National Student Survey. And 95% satisfaction with our support and guidance is what last year's cohort gave us. Now, in terms of the programme support, so that's the support we give just to students on the radiotherapy programme from within the programme, we have a very well structured programme of support. Every student is allocated a personal tutor, so this is your um, kind of your named nurse equivalent if you are out in the hospital environment. So this is somebody who will be your first port of call if you have any issues or you want advice, whether that be um, to do with social issues, academic issues or other pastoral issues. 
we have year tutors for each of the three year groups. And so the first year tutor has an oversight of all issues related to first year delivery. OK, so that will be any issues with the modules um, and any issues with your first year clinical placements. Our programme tutor has oversight of the whole programme. So that's first year right through to third year. Um, she's responsible for ensuring the high quality delivery of our programme. She will grant extensions if students require them. Uh, she will deal with any academic misconduct issues that might occur or any fitness practice issues that might occur. So she has a very important role in making sure that we, we give you as, as good an educational experience as we can. Crucial to the team are our clinical link lecturers. So these are members of the lecturing team at the university who have specific responsibility for visiting students when they're out on clinical placement. Now, they are not the only placement support that we have for our students. We also have one or two people based within each department who will act on behalf of the university when the link lecturers can't visit. So if you're out on placement and you have an issue, you would go and speak to your practice educator in the first instance. And then if it was a day for your clinical link lecturer to be visiting, you would speak to them about it too. We also have um, a specialist tutor within the team who um, has responsibility for supporting students with complex needs. That happens to be me. Um, and what I do there is I um, deal with students who might have specific learning difficulties that impact on the way that they um, are able to learn or students who might have um, mental health issues or other complex needs that might go beyond the remit of a personal tutor but because I've had experience working with our mental health and well-being team and the disability team in previous roles that I've had at the university um, I take on this role within our program so that I know then when I need to refer students on to the more centralised support. A common question I have is about clinical placements. So this slide is to show you where our clinical placements are cited. So the red star shows Hatfield, which is about 20 miles north of London. And then Peterborough is about 35 miles north of Hatfield. Um, Northampton and Cambridge, um, each of those is about 25 to 30 miles from Hatfield. And then as we go further south, we have our North London site at Charing Cross Hospital, West London site at Mount Vernon Hospital, then Oxford and Reading out in the Chilterns, and then further south we have Portsmouth and Poole. Now when we're de deciding which students go to which placement, we allow you to make some choice. So when you first join the university, we'll give you a list with all of those placement sites listed and then we'll ask you to rank them from one to nine in order of preference um, for your placement site. And then our clinical lead, Sam, will have a look at all of the decisions that the um, students have made and she will then try and allocate first choices where she can. Um, but normally um, it will some students might also be given their second choice. So you'll need to think very, very carefully about where you go. It's very, very rare indeed that a student doesn't get either their first or second choice site. Now, if you're somebody who has a specific reason why you need to be placed at a particular site, so for example, you live in Oxford with your family, you've got children at school in Oxford, so you need to stay in Oxford, then we would look at those sorts of requests very sympathetically and where possible try to um, allocate a placement accordingly. Um, but mostly what we will do is look at what facilities are available at particular sites and try and place students as fairly as we can. In the second year, you go through the same process. You then apply again to go to a particular site or you rank your sites one to nine. But in the second year, what we like to do is try and rotate you to a different clinical site because what we want to do is make sure you get the full breadth of experience of different radiotherapy techniques. So for example, at the moment, within our nine sites, it's only Cambridge and Oxford that are treating um, 
paediatric cases, so children with cancer. So if that's something that you want to see, one of your placement sites at some point is going to have to be there. And if you were placed, say, at Peterborough for whole three years, you would never see paediatric cases. OK, so we're going to rotate you around once every year to make sure that you see the full spectrum of placements. Now, this has been something our students have really valued, and it means that you also get to see different techniques and, the, and work with different people. You see different demographics of patients. So you can imagine that the, the demographic of patients you're going to see in the middle of London at Charing Cross might be very different to the demographic of people who live in Poole in Dorset. We're very proud that um, we have a consistently high employability for our students in that when we do a check six months after graduation, 100% of our graduates are either in employment or they're carrying out further study. Now, it's not always the case that they're in radiotherapy employment because some um, students will choose to go into different careers once they've gained their degree. When we think about the career pathways open to our students once they've graduated and begun to build their um, experience as qualified radiographers, there are a few different routes that they might want to take. And we know that there are very clear clinical, managerial and education pathways after graduation for therapeutic radiography students. So I thought it might be nice to introduce you to a few of our graduates. So at the top there is Kevin and he is now the um, the Director of Cancer Services at UCLH in London. This is a, a big hospital and they're going to be hosting one of the first new proton centres in the UK. I think it's nearly um, ready to go, the other one being in Manchester. And he graduated with us around about 16 years ago now. Um, and so his career has moved up through the, um, the normal ranks of treatment radiographer roles and he moved quite quickly into management and now he's managing whole um, trust departments, not just radiographers. Um, in the middle there is Laura um, and she took a, a, a different career pathway. Um, she went into education and she was a lecturer with Sheffield Hallam University following graduating with us. Um, and within that role, she developed an interest in public health. And so she's been working for Public Health England for a couple of years um, as on a secondment basis and um, being the representative for radiotherapy um, in terms of public health issues. Um, she's now gone back into education and has just started a new job at Lincoln University. Um, now, some of our students do come back and work with us on our lecturing team and the bottom right hand corner is Sam, one of our senior lecturers and our clinical lead. Um, and she started her career at the University of Hertfordshire as a student. She then worked at several different hospitals as a radiographer before coming back to join us as a lecturer around about 12 to 13 years ago. Now, some of our students, even though they get their radiotherapy degree, they decide they don't really want to practice in radiotherapy because other things develop for them. And, and the bottom picture is a boot camp. And this is one of our graduates who, um, to fund his studies, um, having been in the military before he joined us, um, set up a small business doing boot camp style exercise programs locally. Um, and this was a part time job that he started just to fund his radiotherapy studies. But it took off so well, rather than have a radiotherapy career when he graduated, he decided to carry on with the boot camp um, business and he has told us that the um, the transferable skills he gained within his degree related to communication with people, managing his time, being able to um, relate uh, to people at all different levels and just those general patient care skills have translated really well into this new um, self-employed business. So just to say all of the skills that you learn in a radiotherapy programme are not just focused on radiotherapy. You will learn an awful lot of other skills, research skills, personal skills, um, just, a, just a whole range of things that are going to help you with your careers in the future. So this slide is all about how you're going to be able to afford to be a student. So this is the fees and finance. 
Now, all universities are now charging tuition fees, and at the University of Hertfordshire, our standard tuition fee for home students is £9,250 per year. It's the same for um, European Union students at the moment. I'm not sure what um, the Brexit changes will um, will do to that figure, whether it will stay the same or, or be different. And our international students are charged £15,400 a year. This is a non-standard fee for the university. So if you look at the international pages on our website, you might see a lower fee. The reason this is higher is because um, we take account of the clinical placements that you would be studying as well. And so this covers all of the same things that the other tuition fees for the home students um, cover, which is, yes, your tuition at the university, but also um, the costs for students on placement, occupational health screening, provision of your clinical placement uniforms and the cost of the um, disclosure and barring service checks that we have to um, carry out. Now, there are some sources of finance that will help you. Um, it was recently announced that there would be a £5,000 grant awarded to all healthcare profession students who are eligible to receive the learning support fund. So I don't think this applies to international students. I think this is just something that applies to our home students. Now, the £5,000 is for any student and then there are um, grants of between £1,000 and £3,000 available, depending on whether you are studying um, um, an at, what we call an at-risk um, program and radiotherapy is one of those so you will definitely get an extra £1,000 on top of that five and then there are other grants for people who have dependents or um, have specific um, circumstances so if you have a look at the link that I've put on the slide that will give you much more information about those grants what's important about those is that you do not have to pay them back the tuition fees um, you pay um, via a loan um, and you apply for that and um, are allocated through Student Finance England. But the, the five to eight thousand pound grants are non repayable. You'll get you're given those to help you cope because we know that students on health programmes are much more likely to be affected financially than students on other types of programme. The Learning Support Fund that I mentioned earlier is something that helps our students with travel or accommodation costs. So you might be a student that has accommodation in our halls of residence in the first year, but you might be going down to Oxford on placement. Now, if you don't have a car, you might have to find accommodation in Oxford, but you don't want to give notice at your accommodation in Hatfield because the placements that we send our students on are only for six to eight weeks. Um, so this is going to be an extra cost. And so what the Learning Support Fund does is allow students to pay for that extra accommodation while they're on placement and then claim it back. Similarly, if you decided to drive or travel to your placement site and stay living in your Hatfield accommodation, um, then you would get that um, travel cost reimbursed as well. There are other um, aspects to the learning support fund re related to people who have dependents and there's a hardship fund. So again, if you have a look um, at the learning support fund information on the internet, you'll find out much more information. And there's also information and links from our um, radiotherapy and oncology page as part of the university website. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope that's given you enough information um, to help you um, make your choices when it's um, coming to making your decisions about your offers. If you have any further questions or queries, please do contact us. Um, that's me in the middle in the red dress. Um, I'm the admissions lead and then Helen Galloway is my colleague on the admissions team and the radiotherapy at hearts.ac.uk um, email address is monitored by other members of our team as well to make sure that we can get back to people within 24 to 48 hours if you have a query. Enjoy your summer and uh, hopefully we look forward to seeing you in September, October time.